Well, good morning, everyone. And if you're in Canada watching this broadcast, a happy Victoria Day long weekend. Uh, thank you for finding your way to Eastminster's I Worship service, which we like to call this service has 32 minutes or thereabouts. Whether you're a member of Eastminster or you're joining us from somewhere else through the web, we appreciate your presence here. And uh, we trust that, as always, this service would allow you to draw closer to God uh, during this time of pandemic. One announcement before we begin today. We are two weeks away from the Sunday we know as Pentecost on May the 31st. And at Pentecost at Eastminster, we usually have a communion service. So I'm giving you fair notice because in spite of the fact that we can't get together, we will observe the sacrament of Holy Communion on that Sunday through this uh, miracle of the World Wide Web. And uh, I invite you to maybe add to your grocery list over the next week or two, uh, some grape juice or something like that to help us all and to help you in particular on that day, draw near to God through the sacrament. So two Sundays from now, we'll have the sacrament of Holy Communion. Well, as we begin today, let us pray. Ever-present Lord, it is a marvelous thing that even though we may not meet together in physical community, and even though we may not meet together in a sanctuary that has been dedicated to you, we may still meet with you. We're in different places around our town and far off, but yet you are near. And as we take the time to enter into your presence, we pray that you would remove from us all impediments to worship. Forgive us for times we have failed to see your wonders in the world. Forgive us for times when we have walked through holy moments and not savored your presence. Forgive us for our busyness and those things that distract us from you. And so as we begin our worship today, we thank you for Jesus who opens eyes and opens ears to your being. In him, may we experience forgiveness and be enabled to see the holy and the hope that Christ has given the world. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we have a few wonderful pieces of music for you. First of all, Martin is going to sing a Don Francisco song, Since I Met Him, and that will come up in a moment. And then George and uh, Bruce and Rebecca are going to sing the ever popular but sort of a new version of His Eye is on the Sparrow that will be after the message. And that'll be followed by Rebecca singing uh, you say the Lauren Dagg piece. And uh, that's just a wonderful uh, song. If you can hang in there for that, it's well worth it. Well, for now, I'm going to hand you over to Martin and then Kyra will come in and uh, she will give our scripture reading today from 1 Peter chapter 3. Well, it's hard to describe what my life used to be To someone who's always been able to see You know, I wasn't unhappy or bitter that way But everything's changed since I met him that day Well, I was down by the corner, just passing the time Just sitting in the sunlight and feeling it shine when the sound of a crowd began to grow in my ear So I waited and I listened as I heard them draw near Then a man stepped up to me and spat on the ground Put the mud on my eyes and then smeared it around Sent me off to Siloam to wash off the clay Then I opened my eyes and I looked at the day how we did it I just know what happened to me yesterday I was in darkness 
But since I met him, I can see When the Pharisees heard it, they put me on trial Even called in my parents and grilled them a while And when at the end I defended the man Who had opened my eyes, all the trouble began Cause I said ever since the beginning of time No one's opened the eyes of someone born blind This man sent from God, it just can't be denied So they cursed me and they grabbed me and they threw me outside And I really don't know how he found me I just know who was talking to me It was easy to tell by the sound of his voice He was the reason I see And as soon as he spoke to me I couldn't hide the emotion that welled up from deep down inside And combined with the dreams that he'd made to come true To kneel there and worship was all I could do And I called him my Lord and my Savior For everything he's done for me Yesterday I was in darkness But since I met him I can see and I called him my Lord and Messiah For everything he's done for me Yesterday I was in darkness But since I met him Since I met him Well, since I met him, I can see Today's Bible reading is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 22. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous. To bring you to God, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. May the Lord bless to your understanding the reading of the Holy Word. Well, this coming Tuesday will mark nine weeks of shutdown here in Ontario uh, because of this COVID-19 situation. Um, I recall now with a bit of humor, our first management team, which was just a few days before that, our first meeting, we decided that we were going to close the church down for two weeks and thought that was absolutely outlandish at the time. And uh, I suspect there will come a time this year when we will be able to open up for small services with appropriate levels of social distancing and all that sort of thing. But it's probably um, obvious to all of us now that we aren't going to be able to have full-fledged services like we had uh, earlier in February, uh, for instance, uh, for quite some time. This virus is here to stay. It's not going away. And we are going to just have to learn to live with it until a vaccine arrives. 
Now that thought can instill in us a measure of uncertainty and fear and anxiety. And some people are maybe thinking that we're just sitting around waiting for the inevitable encounter. The virus is like an enemy lurking, waiting, ready to pounce on us. And uh, in the midst of this sort of feeling, we, we need hope. So I asked some people in our congregation, what is it that gives you hope? And I asked them to just do a short video of what gives them hope. And a number of them responded, and here they are. The sun is still shining. The birds are still singing. That and faith gives me hope. Even when we are in isolation, we are not alone. In the middle of this pandemic, the natural world is doing just fine. In fact, it's thriving with all of us in our houses. And I find that teaches us that we're part of creation, not the masters of creation. And I think it's an opportunity to learn that. And I find that hopeful and exciting. What gives me hope is the many loving, caring people that I've met in this community and around the world. There are so many good Samaritans out there. What gives me hope in this world is the true underlying belief that there is goodness in everyone and that far outweighs any negativity or hatred. What gives me hope is how people are learning how to cope with these difficult times. They're learning to use Zoom so that they can uh, connect regardless of the fact that we have to physical distance and regardless of the fact that we have to wear masks and uh, we're self-isolating. We're finding new ways to connect and I think this is wonderful and it's going to be uh, good for the future. What gives me hope is the wail of a newborn child, the return of hummingbirds, bumblebees and butterflies, the exchange of vows over a bridal bouquet, the shrieks of laughter of children at play, the love I share with my partner, family and friends, and elderly persons' final goodbye. It gives me hope that we are seeing an increase in compassion and collaboration in our communities and even globally. And I hope that continues. What gives me hope is there still seems to be people around that have common sense what gives me hope is springtime. The buds that are budding in the trees remind me that no matter what is happening, springtime still comes and that God is with us through everything. Well, as I think of difficult situations and the need of hope, I remember the story of Magda Herzberger. Magda was a Romanian Jew, is a Romanian Jew. Uh, she was born in the late 20s, 1920s, her family were uh, middle class, and she uh, described her childhood as something that was harmonious. And she was one of six Jewish students in all of Romania to be allowed to attend this very high level high school in Romania, a very prestigious school. Unlike others, Jewish uh, students in particular were harassed in that school. And uh, that was nothing, however, to what took place once the Second World War started. She said it was horrendous. Eventually, she got kicked out of the school because of her heritage. Her father's job was taken away because they were Jewish. Then they had to pin yellow stars of Stars of David on their clothes as they walked around. They were beaten when they went out. And uh, then in April 1944, she said, the Secret Service, the Secret Police came and took them all off to a ghetto. They were there for a little while, and then they were taken, loaded into cattle cars, and Magda went into the first of three concentration camps that she was in from uh, late April 44 until the end of the war. And in the second and third Camp, she describes how she was forced to dig graves and collect corpses after others had removed their gold teeth and hair. 
in April of 1945, when the British liberated Bergen-Belsen, Magda was found exhausted, lying on top of a heap of corpses. In her biography called Survival, she wrote that it had been a horrendous experience and she struggled to survive the daily routine of terror and psychological torture. The thing that got her through, however, she said, was her hope in God. In silent moments in the camp, I used to pray. And I knew in my heart, she said, that God was going to bring her through and she would make it out alive. Well, after the liberation and a period of recovery, Magda was back in Romania and she became a medical doctor. And later in the United States, she would write of how hope helps a person to survive even the most unthinkable terrors. When I think of hope, I also think about uh, hope in the midst of difficult times, that is. I also think about the church, the early church in particular, in which there was a great deal of persecution. It wasn't all the time, but it was some of the time. And Christians could be subjected to the most horrific of persecutions. At first, there was some abuse from the Jewish community. Uh, because of the Christians' different ideas, uh, there was abuse from the establishment. But then there were the Romans, and this was the worst, because usually it was for some mm, failure to worship Roman gods or worship the Caesar. They would be subjected to the vilest of tortures and, and uh, persecutions. And if, you've, if you're a film buff, watch the film Gladiator. It would be those sorts of things that were occurring. And First Peter uh, addresses the Christian community in the midst of these kinds of persecutions. And he's trying to encourage them. And he sees their suffering as an identification of the Christian with Christ and Christ's uh, suffering. And he encourages Christians, stand tall, stand tall. Don't be intimidated. Don't fear. And he says these words, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting of the hope that is in you. The hope that is in you. Always be ready to make a defense of that. And here, this hope that is in you, Peter is specifically referencing the forgiveness of sins through the cross of Jesus Christ and also the hope of eternal glory that comes from the resurrection of Jesus and the promises that Jesus has given. Always be ready to give an account of the hope that is in you, says Peter. We hear those words as United Church people, and we, we balk. Who, me? Well, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a biblical scholar. I wouldn't know what to say. I'm a private person. Oh, I don't want to foist my beliefs onto others. But the Christian hope is a tremendous hope and a tremendous help to us and to others in times of need. And when you talk about it, it doesn't have to be theological or complicated. It can just be your story, a story of why specifically you have a hope, a Christian hope since I was a little girl, since I was a little boy. I just knew that God was with me, that God was helping me, something like that, with a bit of explanation. I remember in February, uh, before this lockdown happened, one of our women's groups invited me to come and talk about uh, an experience of Christ and then to uh, uh, sort of moderate while others in their group would talk about their experiences of God as well. And uh, it was an incredibly interesting morning as people talked about how God had intersected with their lives. What was it that mm, convinced them of God? 
what was it? How did they feel God helping them in certain situations and that sort of thing? And um, it was it was just so interesting. And these are things that, that we need to share, things that can give us hope, things that can encourage other people when we, uh, we convey them, we talk about them. Peter says we should always be ready to speak of, to defend the hope that is in us. I have a friend, Robert. He has been a United Churchman since the day he was born. He's over 80 now, and he's a good soul, and he does some wonderful things in the life of the church. He's always willing to help others and reach out to others. Well, one day Robert was out. Uh, he had been delivering uh, a number of uh, clothing things, items to a refugee family who had very little. And he dropped by the church afterwards and he came into my office and he was telling me about it and telling me how grateful the people were for the clothes that they had received. And I said to him, well, Robert, did, did you tell them where the clothes came from? And he said, what do you mean, from the church? And I said, yeah. And he said, no. I said, well, did you tell them why you were doing this? What do you mean? He said, well, something like, we do this because we're Christian, or we do this because Jesus told us to give to others and help others out. No, he replied again, should I have? Well, I replied, if no one ever tells anyone that Jesus encouraged us to do these things, no one will ever know. And 50 years from now, there'll be no church. Oh, said Robert. And that started off a bunch of conversations that we had about telling others what we're doing and why we're doing these things. And likewise, I think, if we don't share our stories of what gives us hope, where, there, where then is hope? Where is the church in society? And I think specifically in this age, we need to include a little more reference to Jesus Christ. More now than in the previous generation, because this generation knows nothing in many cases about Christ. They don't know the hope that is ours in Christ. And maybe us just sharing those stories would encourage them to investigate a little more encourage them, give them hope. With Peter, let us always be ready to defend, to talk about the hope that is in us. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you are before us. You are in us. You are with us. We sit in your presence wherever we are. We sit in your presence today. And many of us have been in your presence week by week for years. We hear your word. We have hope in Christ. But it's not something we often talk about. Open our minds today to how important it is to pass along what gives us hope. Help us to understand why it's so important to tell our stories, to encourage others, to pass on hope of Christ, especially in days like these, in times of uncertainty and fear. Our world needs hope. This weekend is the usual beginning of our summer season here, and people are opening their cottages and getting away, but usually. But this year is a bit different, and we pray for our community in the midst of pandemic. There are people even in our town who are struggling, struggling to make ends meet. And we pray that you would help us as a community to find ways 
even with pandemic around us, to help others and fulfill the love of Christ in difficult times. We pray for families this weekend. Some will be away. Many will be staying at home. These can be difficult days when children are fed up with restrictions, difficult days when we can't see extended family members. And so in these days of physical distancing, keep us close to each other. Help us to be aware of the various forms of communication that are out there now and keep us close. Bless and protect all relationships that are joyful and, and life-giving and where there are any relationships that are strained. We pray that you would bring understanding and knowledge of new possibilities in them. Lord, help us to give thanks for the love that is possible among us all. Guiding God, we think also of our public officials and politicians and all who are serving you in these days. In uh, these challenging times, guide each leader to uphold the standard of good service above personal gain. Give them wisdom to make faithful decisions and courage when those decisions are unpopular. Create a spirit of um, cooperation and understanding among our leaders, and especially those um, who are so used to emphasizing differences and opposing one another. Lord, may they work for the betterment of our country and our nation and our communities and the betterment of all. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who gave us the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, I'm going to leave you now, but I want to say a word of thanks to our musicians, to Martin and then to George and Rebecca and Bruce, whom you're about to hear from. And uh, thank you so much. And thank you also, Kyra, for reading for us today. Well, I leave you with these words. In the midst of a scary world, offer hope. Point others to life a life that is abundant, a life that is eternal. Tell them your story, what gives you hope. And remember that Jesus is with us, even to the end of an age. Oh, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Well, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know watches me and I sing because I'm happy and I sing because I'm free for his eyes on the sparrow I know he watches me let not your heart be troubled his tender words I hear and resting on his goodness I lose my doubt and fear Though by the path he leadeth By one step I may see His eye is on the sparrow And I know he watches me His eye is on the sparrow And I know he watches me 
Well, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eyes on the sparrow, I know he watches me. clouds arise when songs give place to sighing when hope within me dies I draw the closer to him from care he sets me free his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches well, I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because I'm free, for his eyes on the sparrow, I know he watches me, and I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because I'm free, for his eyes on the sparrow.
de 